On this week's edition, so farewell, Matt Hancock. What does the Hansi Health Secretary sudden fall tell us about truth and consequences inside Johnson's government? And what can we expect from his replacement, Humpty headed Ayn Rand Stan Sajid Javid? <laughs> Cruel, cruel. <laughs> Dorian and I have bald privilege. We're allowed to do this. We, we get to say this. Of, yeah, exactly. And of all the of all the nursery rhyme characters, that is the one he most resembles. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye, Matt Hancock, the man who tragically misunderstood the slogan "hands face space." <laughs> As I'm sure you know, he resigned on Saturday after breaking COVID rules in the form of an affair with an old friend and advisor, which in this government is usually the same thing. Ian, despite having previously called Hancock fucking hopeless, uh, Johnson stood by him on Friday, as did several ministers, only for him to then resign the next day. Given the scale and nature of the story, um, why didn't he just sort of cut to the chase and, and, and sack him? Did either Hancock or Johnson think he'd be able to write it out? Well, evidently, Hancock didn't after 48 hours, but Johnson presumably still did, because at that point he hadn't sacked him, much as he's trying to fucking claim that he has now. You know, so, I mean, I think the answer to that is, you know, is ultimately strategic and conscious. I don't think this is, you know, just something that he accidentally intuitively takes on. I think it is conscious that there is an awareness that you cannot allow standards in public life to be... Um, a condition upon which the government is judged. Because if you do, Boris Johnson will have to fucking go himself. Like, that's mm. key to the whole endeavour. You know, over and over again, he behaves in a way, and this has got nothing to do with affairs, and I really couldn't give a fuck who wants to have sex with whoever the hell they want to have sex with. They can do whatever they like, as far as I'm concerned, and still be decent at the politics, still have a decent public life. This is to do with, you know, would you allow a situation where someone is taking public money that you have not confirmed whether or not you have a reason to be supporting them for that role? This is about whether you're putting out public messaging that you yourself are contravening when you're in your when you're uh, in private, when you're away from people, when you're in the office. We could all come up probably, you know, off the top of our heads with about seven to ten stories immediately that Johnson would be responsible for. So if he says, no, actually, there are such things as standards, then the first person it will be applied to is himself. And for that reason, even when it causes his government damage, he doesn't take action. Do you think it was the um, the harrowing video evidence which the Sun released late on Friday, <laughs> the sort of that made the difference? Because I was I was thinking about this how 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 when something horrific happens, it can be upsetting to read about, worse to see a picture, but the absolute worst is video. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. And people often talk about this, you know, people who, for example, work at Facebook, you know, deciding content that they need to delete. So I wondered whether basically that was that was the deciding factor. Like, why was this why was this different when the government consistently acts with impunity? So, I mean, I think, look, for, for Hancock's in Hancock's head, he would have been sat there that night thinking, can I get away with this? You know, can I survive? You know, am I going to be able to get up on the Downing Street podium, you know, the next week? Where if there's another wave and I have to tell people to be distant, am I going to be able to survive it? Or is every single question that comes back to me going to be about this? And the extent to which that was true was dependent on the level of public outrage. And you can't disconnect the public outrage from that sort of shivering, cringing sense of disgust that you had while watching the video, because that's the kind of thing that makes people talk about it more, makes people think about it more. It means it has a deeper emotional reaction to them. It spreads further. And so the outrage gets bigger. So there is a connection there. And I'm not denying that, you know, perhaps people sort of discussed over that video on a basic really quite superficial physical level had some role in it. But I think the only sort of pertinence it had was how much it contributed to that sense of public outrage, getting to a point where he thought that he literally just really couldn't get through with the job. And what you were saying about kind of, I suppose, the government's general attitude here um, seems to be summed up by Robert Buckland, uh, Lord Chancellor, Justice Secretary, allegedly a law guy, told Nick Robinson today that basically public standards don't matter because voters don't really care. You know, and basically holding up the elections in May as sort of evidence that, that all of this stuff that the voters didn't really care. Was that kind of a sort of mask off moment, which which really reveals what they think? Yeah, that's put on. I think that's the quiet bit out loud. And actually, that goes to the heart. That's almost that's almost fucking philosophical because it goes to the heart of of really of the populist idea of an idea that you can't you can trace that shit back to fucking Rousseau if you want. You know, th there is a general will. People, if people think and vote a certain way, all that really fucking matters 
is that public opinion, that public sentiment, the institutions that you put around it, like Parliament, like the courts, they don't fucking matter. And we saw that after Brexit with the way that Theresa May, Boris Johnson treated Parliament, treated the courts, treated the press, treated civil society. And also, the other values in politics do not count, except in so far as the public opinion cares about them. So basic public standards, um, ethics in the manner in which you conduct your discourse, anti-corruption practices. Those are only pertinent insofar as the general public gives a shit. As the government looks at it, they look and think they don't give a shit. And therefore, it doesn't matter. And in that moment, Buckland, who I think probably on this fucking podcast, I probably said was the best of the lot when he put that cabinet together. and was like, well, even he has just degraded into the most abysmal moral fucking state by swallowing this kind of philosophy whole and now regurgitating it on radio and TV stations. Roz, the video was filmed on a, on a hidden CCTV camera leaked to the sun by persons unknown. Is this one occasion where, where the conspiracy theorists are right to be excited and have theories about who, who was trying to take Hancock down? No, I, I don't think so. I think it was fairly simple. I mean, the, the story was that it was um, an employee that who was, you know, had access to the footage and and he leaked it because he was so fed up about lockdown. Now, that may or may not be true. It may just be the son's way of avoiding explaining the full origins of the video. We're all filmed constantly in public buildings and on streets. And, you know, it's hardly surprising that a man who during a pandemic, is going to find it hard to pursue an affair anywhere but at work, is, is, is caught in this tryst, as we, uh, as we call it, or clinch, as other people call it. It is <laughs> just, just not surprising. Steamy yeah. clinch. Stevie, well, it was quite Stevie. I found it really uncomfortable to watch this. I was disgusted by myself for, for actually watching it. And then I thought, thought of, I felt, I, I almost felt a kind of pity for Hancock. And I know this is going to seem strange because I have no time for Hancock's politics at all. But we've created this society in which we're comfortable with being recorded all the time. And so when physical contact between people who don't live together is effectively banned, th this is where we end up. We end up gawping at two middle-aged adults snogging in an office. <laughs> and I found myself thinking, oh, God, maybe this will cut through because it's about sex. And I thought... What have you become? <laughs> as, as Ian was saying, I now have so little faith in the ability of the government to behave decently that I'm reduced to their level in order to hope that something can change. I would say a great sympathy reducer is the is the detail, I think, in the Times story uh, that he woke up his eight-year-old uh, oh, yeah. on the night before the story broke this is, uh, to terrible. inform them that he was leaving mummy to go and live with someone else. Yeah, I think that actually cut through much more uh, than, yeah, yeah. The, than maybe even the video itself did. Also last Saturday, Time supported Hancock and me using a private email account for official business for several months during the pandemic. Obviously, that story got a bit swamped. Do you think that's as serious? Yeah, unsurprisingly, I do. I think it's a lot more serious, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, why would you do this unless you had something to hide? That's the question you've got to ask yourself. Why would he do that? Sex always cuts through with the, with the public, it's true, and recklessness and infidelity in your private life sometimes correlates with untrustworthiness in public life, for example, with someone like Boris Johnson. That's not always the case, because some great states people have been, you know, serial shaggers and slept around a lot. It's not always the case. But in this instance, Gina Colladangelo had been put on the public payroll by Matt Hancock. And you have to ask yourself, was that to make it easier for him to conduct an affair with her at work? Was he also using his private email address to help his lover's brother get an NHS contract, which it emerges that he coincidentally also had. And mm. these are questions that we can't properly answer now because he was using this address. And if he has any brains whatsoever, he will now have deleted all the email evidence. So we will be none the wiser. It does seem fair enough. I'm I mean, I don't really mind if Matt Hancock has an affair, but I don't want to actually have to fucking pay for it. <laughs> exactly. like that's asking too much of my liberalism. <laughs> well, last week, we, we, we devoted quite a lot of time to talking about Dido Harding uh, and her bid for the top NHS job. Um, now, she was a close sort of horse friend with uh, Matt Hancock. Um, they're both amateur jockeys. Is her bid effectively dead now, as various anonymous Tories seem to be saying? Um, yes, and I return to my previous point, Millard. 
that this is the <laughs> desirable result of a, a revelation that really had nothing to do with it, that he's been ousted, yeah, yeah. which is a relief, but frankly, not necessarily for the right reasons. Um, Minnie, for all his many flaws, uh, Hancock was a strong sort of pro-lockdown voice in the cabinet at crucial points. And we know, you know, what difference in terms of human lives, timing of lockdowns made. Sergei Chavid immediately promised that reopening would not just be accelerated, but irreversible. Is it basically that's the job he's been given? Don't get in the way of the economy, you know, onwards. Don't don't argue. Yeah, I mean, I think it's not just his job. I mean, obviously, it's the Tories' priority. They've made that really clear um, throughout the pandemic. But I think we also have to remember that the SAG was Chancellor mm. of the Exchequer. His background is business and finance. I mean, he's he's been Secretary of State for every bloody department at this point. But the economy is probably much more within his comfort zone than health and the, the ins and outs of the science I think it's really bolshy of anyone to come in and make that firm a commitment that it's going to be irreversible. I mean, it can't be until the, the literal mm. entire world has a grasp of COVID and vaccinations. So I think his approach to come in and talk about it being irreversible is maybe a response to kind of lack of public confidence because of Hancock. So maybe it was a kind of, if he appears confident, the public feels confident. I mean, that's a pretty basic understanding of it, but that's kind of my only explanation as to why he would come in in that manner. And looking beyond the pandemic, um, as he's a sort of hardcore devotee of, of Margaret Thatcher and Ayn Rand, the piecemeal privatisation of the NHS that Labour is always warning against, is that more likely? Are you more worried uh, about the NHS under, under him than Hancock? I'm I'm always worried about the NHS and the Tories. I mean, I think if you look at the evidence, the, the only evidence that we've got about him that he's going to be kind of more pro-privatisation is his voting record and things that he said previously. So he's previously voted against things like the NHS limiting income from private patients and um, he's voted for lifting the cap on how much trusts can earn from private income. And obviously he's pro-austerity. He was a treasury minister at the time that austerity was implemented Labour have sort of described him as leaving the fox in charge of the chicken coop. Now, where I think we'll work out how far he's willing to take it or, or where we'll get a keener sense of his priorities is the upcoming health and care bill. So a white paper on that bill was published earlier this year. On the face of it, that bill is is to bring the NHS and local authorities together. And so I think there are bits of it that are welcome. But the analysis so far of that white paper is that the bill leaves scope for privatisation, deregulation, sharing of confidential private data with private companies. Um, and uh, it kind of gives more powers to the Secretary of State. So I think that will be the moment at which we know far more about his position. But from my perspective, appointing someone like Sajid Javid, given his background, given his relationships with banks like JP Morgan, it's a pretty clear statement about the direction that the government wants the NHS to go in. I can't believe I'm, I'm missing, missing Matt Hancock already. <laughs> already. <laughs> Sorry for making fun of you earlier, Matt. <laughs> Just got carried away. <laughs> cheap laughs. Um, Ian, finally, there are rumours that Johnson wants to bring him back sort of once he's served his uh, time in the wilderness. Do you think that that's likely, that this is the kind of thing that will be soon forgotten or, or, or could it be difficult to get past the press and public? I don't know. There's no way of telling. I mean, I can't imagine that there is going to be a scenario in which he'd bring him back or what use he would be in any department that he would be brung to. But then being completely hapless and ineffective has never stopped anyone getting into Johnson's cabinet. So I can't rule anything out. 